thank you very much for the for the invitation and for the very the very generous introduction. I'm desperately trying to find some some way of lowering expectations after the, those very generous uh, remarks. Um, I didn't get much sleep last night either, but it was it was much more fun than not getting enough sleep four years ago. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, can you hear me okay at the back? Because I'm wearing this, but it's not a microphone. It's for the uh, it's for the for the uh, visuals. Um, feels a bit like a like a polygraph. I'm thinking that if I make an untruthful remark about German history, kind of jagged lines will go up and down. Um, I've been giving uh, talks uh, based more or less uh, on the conquest of nature for a couple of years now. And I, I always remember the first one, um, which was at the geography department, to my pleasure, uh, the geography department at UCLA. Um, it was on a Friday, and I was staying in the uh, UCLA guest house, and I got up in the morning, and beautiful California sunshine went outside. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students standing in line. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, Wow, the geography department at UCLA certainly knows how to, to get a crowd uh, on a, on a f for a Friday afternoon talk. Turns out, of course, this was also election time. It was the midterm elections, and Bill Clinton was in town that afternoon uh, speaking against proposition whatever. So, so that was what the lines were for. But it was, it was, uh, it was the first of, of, of the talks I've given in, in Germany and here based on, on the book. Uh, this afternoon's talk is both a lot narrower and somewhat broader than the book. Um, it's narrower in that I have mainly left out the specifically environmental issues, things like loss of species, diversity, the risks of new kinds of floods, a very familiar story in this country when you, uh, when you regulate and canalize rivers. But I'd be very glad, of course, to, to answer questions on that aspect. Um, but I will be talking about things which go beyond the, uh, the waterlands of the, of, of the book, uh, such as the German forest uh, as a symbol. I hope what I've uh, got to say will, about Germany will be interesting in its own right, but as Professor uh, Mahoney noted about the book, um, I want to try and encourage some reflections about the American and the similarities and dissimilarities between the German and American cases. Uh, Germany, for example, lacked an idea of wilderness, anything like comparable in resonance to the, to the American idea. Uh, I want to explore the significance of that at the end. Uh, there was, on the other hand, uh, very definitely a German version of the frontier thesis, and particularly the, 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 the Wild East. Uh, it was something that you know, Amer uh, German leaders, and certainly very much including Adolf Hitler, were very aware of, of, of American experience. So Hitler once said, the, uh, uh, the Volga must be our Mississippi. Uh, very explicit uh, analogies drawn. Uh, Germans were also very interested from the end of the 19th century in American national parks, although then as now, German conservation areas were very much uh, smaller. How indeed could it be otherwise, given the huge differences in scale, the spatial disproportion uh, between the USA and Germany? Uh, to give you an idea, the historic Kingdom of Saxony, this great battlefield, this cockpit of European history, Kingdom of Saxony was somewhat smaller than Yellowstone National Park. Um, you could fit present-day unified Germany almost twice over uh, into Texas. Um, the Texans might not like it, um, as the Germ <laughs> Germans might not like it either. Um, now, let me turn to landscape and identity. Landscape is one of those words, like culture and nature, uh, which has many different meanings. If you Google landscape, you get over 200 million hits, and there's another 20 million for Landschaft, the German equivalent. Um, that's more hits than you get. I, you'll see I wrote this before election day. It's more hits than you get from Googling John McCain, Iraq War, Sarah Palin, Whack Job, Moose, and Joe the Plumber combined. So, <laughs> and even when you screen out uh, things like you know, the research landscape of super string theory or you know, the landscape of real estate uh, deals in Fort Lauderdale, you know, things which have nothing to do with landscape, purely metaphorical, it's still a very impressive uh, number. So a reminder, as if we needed one, that landscape means different things. It denotes, of course, the physical world of rock, water, soil, vegetation. Uh, it includes mountains and river valleys uh, whose history is measured in geological time, although humans, of course, have made fundamental changes to uh, those landscapes. That interplay between humans and their physical world 
the ways in which each shaped and was shaped by the other, became an important subject for historians in the first half of the 20th century, and in some cases beyond. Um, it marked the ground where historians and geographers met. Something once in the 19th century taken for granted, then I think very much eclipsed when history became synonymous with political history written from the archives in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then geography comes back into history in the early 20th century. And for a European historian like myself, I think the, one thinks first of all of the Annal school in, in France. Uh, Marc Bloch, the greatest of them, I think, insisted that human history could be found, quote, behind the features of landscape. And he demonstrated how to do it in his wonderful work on French rural society. Georges Duby looked back wistfully in his autobiography to the time when he walked the countryside and examined, quote, a document open to sunlight and to life itself, namely the landscape. W.G. Hoskins was engaged in a very similar enterprise when he wrote The Making of the English Landscape. So what about Germany? Well, the concept of the historical landscape, historischer Landschaft, was developed by the geographer Friedrich Ratzel, whom we heard about a moment ago, in the late 19th century. And Ratzel also coined the term uh, Lebensraum, or, or, or living space, um, and had some influence on the work of Frederick Jackson Turner. There's a good deal of back and forth around the 1890s, 1900, between German and American scholars. Now, Ratzel had some very interesting colleagues at uh, Leipzig. One was Wilhelm Wundt, the psychologist. Um, but a third uh, was, uh, uh, was a historian called Karl Lamprecht, who wrote a series of regional histories in the 1890s that had several shortcomings. The footnotes were very bad. He was very much, uh, very much abused by political historians for his shoddiness. But the works, nonetheless, had a pioneering quality, staking out quite a bit of the ground that the Annal historians would later make their own in France. Not only that, but in the 1920s, this German regional history, Landesgeschichte, uh, uh, struck out against narrow political history by combining disciplines like geography, cartography, using settlement records, uh, studying vernacular architecture, all of this to produce a history of people within their physical settings. This regional history and the so-called folk history with which it overlapped was methodologically innovative and the focus on landscape, this is in the 1920s, was one aspect of that. Which, so far so good, but there's a, there's a big but here. Um, there was a good reason why these German historians in the 1920s, after a German defeat in war and territorial losses, particularly in the East but in the West as well, why they were interested in turning away from political history and issues of where borders were drawn, internationally recognized borders, and focusing instead on elements of folk life that might challenge those borders. This history was, in other words, partly fired by resentment over the Treaty of Versailles. And it was certainly hyper-nationalist and filled with folkish ethnic, German ethnic sentiment. Uh, historians like Hermann Albin and Rudolf Kutschke, the two leading figures, would in fact both, both later serve the Third Reich by providing historical justifications for German expansion in the East. The approach became tainted. And that's one reason why post-war regional history in the Federal Republic shed this baggage. There's simply too much blut und Boden, blood and soil. And it's surely one reason why, interestingly, even the Annal School, not tainted, of course, in, in any such way, why it found such a tepid, even hostile response from liberal, critical German historians in the 1970s. The problem here is that the shadow of the Nazi past falls over so much that can be taken for granted in the United States. Uh, two American environmental writers, William Wittek and Wes Jackson, they edit a book called Rooted in the Land, perfectly harmless title. Translate that into German, you get Schollengebunden, rooted to the soil, which is a kind of signature Nazi adjective uh, uh, celebrating the heroic German peasantry. If I can quote the great British TV playwright Dennis Potter, the trouble with words is that you don't know whose mouth they've been in. Uh, <laughs> the problem in Germany is that you know exactly whose mouth they've been in. They've been in Hitler's mouth. Um, 
It's taken a long time to confront these ghosts that haunted any reference to land and soil. Just as it took a long time for a tainted concept like Heimat, literally homeland, but it's a kind of sentimental term which in the Third Reich was dreadfully uh, tainted. Uh, took, it a, took a long time for this term to be taken up again, critically dusted down and sort of put back to work. And that began to happen in the 1980s. That was also the decade when the constructivist turn, or culturalist turn if you want, in history, produced that great spate of books in which everything was constructed, invented, or imagined. And if, if, you've, read the, um, if you've read The Conquest of Nature, you will know I, I have a certain amount of criticism of this uh, idea that everything is invented uh, or imagined. Um, and I'm sympathetic to Gertrude Stein's comment. She was talking about Oakland. Uh, and she said, there's no there there. You know? and, I, and I worry about these invented and imagined histories, that there's no there there. My point is, and it's argued fairly passionately in, in the book, uh, is that there's no reason not to try and bring together this history of representations, imagined places, uh, with the history of the physical and the material. Uh, it doesn't mean that I want us to jettison all the things we've learned from the history of representations. Landscapes were one of the subjects that attracted renewed historical attention during the 80s, this cultural or constructivist turn. Landscape was a kind of mental topography, uh, a screen onto which humans projected a variety of emotions. It might be uh, uh, love, fear, uh, loss, resentment, all, all manner of emotions projected onto this screen. Uh, above all, as a source of identity. There's a classic work in this idiom, an essay collection edited by the historical geographers, the, the late, very much, very much lamented Dennis Cosgrove and Stephen Daniels, a uh, book called The Iconography of Landscape. And that's really what I want to explore in the, uh, uh, in the remainder of this talk, how certain features of landscape came to be widely seen uh, in the modern era in Germany, roughly the last 200 years, as iconic as somehow representative of German character, German virtue. But which features of landscape? And one answer might be all of them. Um, even as the idea gained shape in the 19th century that their landscape was the birthright of all Germans, defining and sustaining them, this didn't diminish the importance attached to what was locally distinctive. Quite the contrary, in fact. Uh, for a key 19th century writer like Wilhelm Heinrich Riel, whose name will come up several more times, the uniqueness of local landscapes was exactly what was to be valued and preserved from the threat of uniformity. That was the view adopted by conservationists such as the music professor Ernst Rudolf, indeed by so-called Heimat protectionists uh, in general. The need to preserve the genius of the place against the commercial forces that threatened to make one place indistinguishable from any other place, a familiar issue. So the German landscape came to be represented as a patchwork quilt. Uh, Riel actually referred to a rainbow. Um, its parts adding up to an organic whole. And in the work of, the wonderful work of Celia Applegate on the Palatinate, uh, and more recently of Thomas Leakin on the Eiffel region, these are both uh, regions just on the left bank of the Rhine, we can see how those who worked to foster the idea of the small local Heimat, the local homeland, and not least its landscape, how they linked this to a larger German homeland. So the larger homeland is a series of distinctive local Heimats. Now at this point, I want to observe, a, I think, an important paradox. Given the suspicion of the modern world expressed by men like Riel and Rudolf, there's irony in the fact that the very developments that they deplored actually opened up the German landscape and helped to make it an object of identification. It was the railroad and the steamship that made it possible to enjoy panoramas of the Rhine, that great 19th century word, the panorama. It was carefully marked trails with scenic views uh, that greatly, carefully marked by the Heimat organizations, that greatly increased the number of visitors to places like the Palatinate and the Eiffel. And if you read Teda Fontana's Wanderings through the, March, uh, through the Mark Brandenburg, um, you'll see many of the wanderings actually were undertaken by, by railroad and, uh, and steamship. Um, 
And the difference really between Fontana and, and countless other travel writers of the mid-19th century was that Fontana acknowledged this and had a certain sort of playful, self-ironic series of references to the fact that he was, uh, that his Wanderung and the wanderings were not always on foot. Um, that's one of the points that runs through my book, The Conquest of Nature. And it's an argument I was interested to see that also informs a very interesting new book in American history, David Stradling's Making Mountains. Uh, New York City and the Catskills. It's really about the way in which the Catskills are constructed by people from, uh, from New York City, an urban, an urban center. And while new means of communication and well-marked trails made a wide range of German landscapes more physically accessible, travel writing, guidebooks, picture postcards, and the like reinforced a mental image of them, imagined landscapes for the imagined nation. These processes cut deeper as we enter the 20th century. Think, for example, of the impact of newsreels, or of motorization and the quite deliberate landscaping of the early Autobahnen in Germany, in such a way that they afforded vistas over the German countryside. But the common thread remained the idea that Germany contained many different variegated landscapes, the celebratory idea of unity in diversity. But, if all German landscapes were equal, some were more equal than others. While some landscapes became established as quintessentially German, others remained a source really of only local or regional identification. <coughs> Give an example of the German coastline. Uh, in the East Friesland Peninsula and in Schleswig-Holstein, coastal marshes and polders and the system of dikes that protected them these were constitutive of local identity, no doubt about that. Historical and fictional works celebrated the struggle against the sea. The sea was described as Rasmus or shiny hands. Um, the morally charged injunction, wer will nicht deichen, der muss weichen. Whoever is unwilling to build dikes has to step aside. Uh, that signified local pride in the heroic preservation of a landscape and a way of life over many generations. But by comparison, say, with the Netherlands, just, uh, just to the west, this never became a symbol of national identity. Um, Theodor Storm's great novella, Der Schimmelreiter, didn't elevate the North Sea coast to such a status. Nor did national socialist land reclamation projects, very widely publicized, though they were, in newsreels and so on. Um, even the land reclamation projects in Schleswig-Holstein, which occupied a special place in the German national movement. N none of this actually suffices to make the coastline um, a place with which Germans as a whole identify. And broadening this out, by comparison with European nations such as Portugal or Britain, uh, where the national myth rested heavily on mastery of the oceans, the coastline never became a privileged site of German national identification. Um, that was true despite Kaiser Wilhelm II's boast, our future lies on the water, and builds a battle fleet. Despite the abiding mystique of the Hansa League, Danzig, for example, uh, Danzig had a powerful place in the pantheon of German symbolic landscapes, but it was Danzig's connection to the hinterland, the land side, uh, and to past German colonization in the east that was front and center of the myth, rather than Danzig looking out to a wider world. Or another example, um, the periodical Die Gegenwart um, described Königsberg, coastal Königsberg in 1850, as, quote, this farthest outpost of German life. That's a remarkable image for a, a, for a city on the coast. Try to imagine somebody in England describing Bristol or Liverpool as this farther outpost of English life. No, it's meaningless because Bristol and Liverpool are cities that very self-consciously look out over the Atlantic. They're part of a link to a wider world. It's not what's behind, it's what's in front that matters. So perhaps it's not surprising that Julius Langbein's notorious radical right bestseller of 1890, Rembrandt as educator, argued so passionately for infusing the dry spirit of landlocked Prussia, as he saw it, with the vigor of the Dutch and British North European type, the Rembrandt type. Uh, bred, as he argued, by bracing exposure to the sea. Um, it's an extremely strange book. Uh, th there's one passage where he contrasts 
German professors, landlocked German professors, stuck in their musty, stifling studies. And then he seems to be offering a comparison with their British counterparts whose bracing lives are lived within, within distance of kind of seagulls flying overhead. It's a, I, I kind of lost him when he, when he started talking about seagulls. It's a, very, it's a very bizarre book. It's also a very dark book. Um, best known, I think more often quoted than, than read, but best known for its uh, anti-urban and especially anti-Semitic passages. My argument, though, is that this bestseller certainly uh, went with the grain and, and had resonance in Germany. Uh, with its anti-Semitic passages. But I don't think that uh, it did anything to correct this uh, absence of a, a powerful resonance in the German, uh, it, the German mind of, you know, of the coastline as something with which they identified. The imagined German landscape remained, I think, closer to Frederick the Great's view of the world in the 18th century when he, he once said sardonically, uh, well, he said most things sardonically, but what he said was, Quote, land animals like us are not accustomed to live among whales, dolphins, turbot, and codfish. Isn't that great? Um, there's another celebrated figure in the, in the Prussian pantheon, Otto von Bismarck, um, who took a similar view. Uh, his chief interest in dolphins, Bismarck this is, was hiring fishermen uh, to row him out into Norderney Bay where he shot them. Uh, shooting dolphins in your spare time. Um, it's certainly depraved. Whether it's more depraved than shooting wolves from a helicopter, I, I don't know. I... <laughs> so, coastline and ocean, uh, regional rather than national, uh, in its resonance. What about the mountains? There's been a flurry of recent interest by European historians in mountains and identity. The Pyrenees, the Carpathians, the Alps. Uh, the Cosgrove and Daniels book I cited earlier uh, has an interesting essay arguing that the landscape painter, uh, Edwin Landseer, was instrumental really in creating a, a myth-laden 19th century image of the Scottish Highlands as the embodiment of a tranquil natural order. This, the work of this painter in a sense helps to construct an idealized image of the Scottish Highlands. Um, you might expect to find the construction of similar images of the German mountains and to some degree, that did happen, particularly from the late 19th century. Uh, Friedrich Löscher, in the first issue of a new publication called The Calendar for the uh, Iron Mountains and the Falkland in <coughs> 1905, Löscher praised the local landscape, and he described this new publication as, quote, a wanderer, one, a wanderer is a great figure in, uh, in its, you know, whether it's Schubert, whether it's German paintings, uh, uh, whether it's Wanderungen, the wanderer is a great romantic figure, runs through the 19th century. Quote, a wanderer from the mountains, this is the publication, that will not only travel abroad, but will gain entry into the homes and hearts of the Heimat and claim its rightful place there. And he went on that it would, this publication, quote, evoke the fresh air of the mountain heights and the scent of the spruce trees, even for city dwellers, and will beckon to them, come up to us in the mountains. End of quote. Now, an unabashed interest in tourism joined hands here with the desire to encourage visitors to what was in fact the German side of a mountain range that served as a border uh, between southern Saxony and Czech-speaking northern Bohemia. The German-Austrian Alps present a more familiar case. Uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, we find the German and Austrian Alpine Club sounding a harsh uh, Folkish note. Uh, the club presented itself as a, quote, bulwark of German culture and the German mountaineering spirit. An embodiment, I'm quoting again, of German courage, German strength, and German unity. The mountains themselves, it proclaimed as part of the, quote, common heritage of the folk. Youth especially would be tested it was said, and find national consciousness and love of Heimat, unquote, in the mountains. The link being made between mountain landscape and folkish sort of racial ethnic identity was evident in the association's Totsa guidelines of 1923, which dealt with hut and trail construction, which were intended to groom, as the phrase went, German character and German spirit. Uh, and if that isn't explicit enough for you, there's an even more explicit uh, uh, 
uh, they passed uh, so the so-called Aryan paragraphs in the 1920s uh, that expelled Jews from the German uh, Alpine German and Austrian Alpine Association. It won't surprise you to learn that the Austrians set the pace and the German chapters of the Alpine Association followed, uh, followed along more or less, uh, mainly, uh, mainly less, reluctantly. Um, how far the mountains served as a wider symbol of German identity? It's, I think, hard to tell. There's not much to be learned from the thousands of pilgrims, I guess we could call them, who are... Uh, uh, go off to Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps um, to see Hitler because the destination is pretty much contingent and we have to assume that you know, in the unlikely event that Hitler had established a summer home in the Lüneburg Heath the pilgrims would probably have turned up there as well. Um, the cult of mountain films in the 1930s the genre in which the <coughs> dancer Leni Riefenstahl got her start in films as an actress um, these mountain films provide stronger evidence for the imaginative hold of the pure, unsullied mountain landscape on urban audiences. Uh, although it's interesting that um, there were many in the Alpine associations who considered these films disgracefully sensation-mongering. Um, and there were Heimat conservationists, one of them was called Hans Pudor, who Pudor said that this rush to the mountains had, quote, something pathological about it. So, yes, the mountains feature in the German imagination, but it's, uh, I think, it, it Still, um, it, it still falls short of being a national symbol. Now, the mountain landscape first became prized, uh, beginning with the edu educated middle classes, through the prism of the romantic gaze. But it was another more ubiquitous feature of the German landscape, uh, which underwent a similar revaluation in these years. Um, which came to play a much more central part in German national identity, this early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, romantic moment. I'm referring to the German forest, der Deutsche Wald, the German forest. Um, probably worth saying that uh, my, my book, Conquest of Nature, is about water and the German landscape, but everywhere I went, and particularly in Germany, people wanted to ask me about the forest. Um, I did an article for Das Parlament, which is the... Uh, newspaper of the German parliament and they have these frequent supplements and they asked me to write an article based on the book but it had to be about the forest. <laughs> uh, I was interviewed by the Tageszeitung in Berlin. Uh, all the questions were about the forest. Um, the German forest as myth was a creation of uh, the romantics. Romantic literature, painting, music inverted the old aesthetic of the forest uh, as it did the aesthetic of the seashore. What had once been viewed as savage was now viewed as sublime. From the beginning, uh, a distinctive strand of this myth was the supposed affinity between forest, German forest, German people. This is often traced back to Tacitus, whose remarks about the vigorous Germanen as a kind of woodland race were endlessly recycled. The collectors of German fairy tales and folk legends uh, sang the same song. And by the time Wilhelm Heinrich Riel wrote in the middle of the 19th century about the connections between landscape and people and praised the forest as, quote, a truly magnificent preserve of our most unique national customs um, and arguing that it exerted a, quote, profound influence on all social classes. By that time, the German forest was already well embarked on its brilliant career as a mystical, sentimental expression of German national character. Now, f forest, feeling for the forest, Waldgesinnung, uh, didn't automatically mean national feeling. Um, when Ludwig Tieck, the romantic writer, coined the phrase Waldeinsamkeit, or forest solitude, this suggested a, a dreamy sense of loss uh, much more than any kind of political agenda. The woods in the, the wonderful paintings of Caspar David Friedrich with their crosses and ruined abbeys. These convey a mood of transience, melancholy, of spiritual longing that can't be reduced to politics. Um, all of this said, however, Friedrich's French chasseur painting, the French chasseur uh, soldier lost in the German forest, was an openly political nationalist painting. And Friedrich's contemporary, Ernst Moritz Arndt, called for a so-called defensive forest 
against the French, the idea that the forest itself could be a kind of defensive barrier against the French enemy. The forest became increasingly a nationalist icon in the 19th century, and especially an icon of sort of national virility uh, and military prowess. That's the meaning of the uh, monument to the uh, Hermannsschlacht, this uh, uh, battle, uh, 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 this monument unveiled in the Teutoburg forest just four years uh, after German victory over the French uh, in 1871 had brought about, finally, uh, a, a unified imperial Germany. Foresters themselves helped to construct this association between forest and people. As many of them turned away from the doctrine of scientific forests that have produced, and here's an environmental reference, there are some, these pine monocultures, the so-called conifer factories, just you know, pine tree after pine tree. As foresters turned away from this, so the older mixed forest was praised as the healthy symbol of a healthy race. The ethnic folkish dimensions of these arguments were made quite explicit. They even included complaints that the misguided move to the scientific forestry and the pine monocultures could be traced to the spirit of, quote, homeless nomads, in other words, to, to Jewish thinking. Um, one prominent advocate of a return to the true German forest was Rudolf Duisberg. And he set out his arguments at length in 1910 in a book called The German Forest as Educator, consciously echoing Langbein's title. Um, the arguments made during World War I for a mobilization of the forest had a long history behind them. And these associations became even closer and more fervent in the 1920s uh, when the idea of the Dauerwald or sustainable forest uh, was also put forward as something typically German folkish. And this is before the National Socialists take over this whole ideology and put it to propaganda use. And so we have Hermann Goering, who wore many hats, but one of them was Reich Master of Forests. Um, you have Goering proclaiming in a very typical pronouncement, the eternal forest and the eternal folk belong together. Now, one of the questions that's much exercised historians is how we disentangle this melange of the ecological, the aesthetic, and the racist, because they're all clearly there. And it's a very important issue, which um, is central to recent debates over the green and the brown, so-called, uh, environmental, environmentalism within the brown Third Reich. Uh, and it's something I discuss in the book. Uh, I'd be very glad to talk about that issue. I've written on it a bit, as well as in the book. Um, but I want to go in a slightly different direction uh, now in the talk and ask, was this mental landscape, this idealized German forest, was it associated with untamed wilderness or with the interplay between humans and the natural world? Uh, and to give the answer in advance, I think it's the latter, and I want to build an argument on that. It's not that you can't find in people like Riel, in the Romantics, in some conservationists, you can find arguments for the forest as a wild place. And it, you know, if I was cherry picking quotations, I could give you an impressive number. Yet it seems to me that the overwhelming weight of the German forest myth actually lies elsewhere in the several different ways in which relations of people and forest were idealized. So not untamed wilderness, but something more interesting. One self-regarding conviction uh, that Germans had about the forest, uh, derived from Germany as the so-called fatherland of forestry. It's the belief that Germans had a special talent for managing the forest responsibly. Foresters and Heimat conservationists who criticized these conifer factories didn't want a forest untouched by humans. They didn't want a wilderness. They wanted a forest that was productive but sustainable. Um, that was why the pine monocultures were criticized for depleting the soil and lowering water tables, what came to be called Festepung. It's interesting, Festepung is kind of the dust bowl effect or, or desiccation, drying out. But Festepung is a very culturally laden term. It refers to the creation of a kind of steppe, i.e. Asiatic landscape, i.e. something you associate with Russian, you know, Asiatic Russia rather than civilized Germany. So Festepung is a culturally, even racially loaded term. Um, so an ecologically good idea wrapped up in, a, in, 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 in racist terminology. And there's a lot of that, and I'll come back to that at the end, how you unwrap it. 
At the same time, the responsibly managed forest supposedly revealed the special relationship of Germans to nature. Uh, language you find in right through the 19th century and into the 20th, and it's very much there in the language of, uh, of Nazi so-called landscape planners in the 1940s. I think there are parallels here in the German idea of a special relationship to animals, to brother animals, to Brudertier. What was most central to the forest myth, though, was the belief that the forest had been formative of national character because Germans had been tested by the forest as they built settlements, uh, sowed crops, uh, uh, pastured animals, and so on. That was why the forest was educator in Duisburg's term. In his view, and you can find, find it in countless other works, um, the German people had been, like the forest, I'm quoting uh, Duisburg now, deeply rooted, sedentary, i.e. not nomadic, like the Jews, um, or ignorant, rapacious hunter-gatherers, like the Slavs. And as Professor Mahoney mentioned, uh, I talk in the book about how uh, the Slav peoples of Eastern Europe are very much troped, as, uh, rather as Native Americans were. In fact, there are uh, it's, they're very, 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 very close parallels. And it's interesting that you find some Polish writers as early as the 19th century describing themselves as the Indians of the Germans' imagination. They're, they're, they're very well aware of this. Um, but back to this idea of the forest as the, as, the, uh, as the environment which tames and toughens. Germans, quoting Duisburg again, had, quote, risen to greatness in the struggle with rough climate and through hard work on poor soil. Human exertions and German virtues were almost always present in this myth of the German forest. Um, the forest myth was romantic, often ethnic folkish, and always self-serving. But it wasn't a wilderness myth. It was, in fact, much closer to a pioneer myth or a frontier myth. And that's what I suggest at much more much greater length in the book. Now, let me turn from the forest specifically and try and broaden this argument. Uh, not wilderness, but, uh, uh, but human, uh, a human-centered myth. The most celebrated German landscape of the modern era was the Middle Rhine between Bingen and Koblenz, the Romantic Rhine. What made it romantic? Well, the spectacle of nature was part of the answer, of course. The, you know, the winding river, these wonderful uh, basalt uh, uh, cliffs, these kind of striations of the, of the cliff face. Um, but evidence or reminders of a human presence also formed an essential element of what made the Middle Rhine romantic. The literary associations of the Lorelei, the villages perched dramatically between the river and the rock face. Even on the romantic Rhine, the idea that uh, uh, what was romantic was the juxtaposition of the natural and the human, and the harmony supposedly between them was central to the idea of a desirable landscape. Now, many conservationists and Heimat enthusiasts were actually quite skeptical of places like the Romantic Rhine, because they saw them as tourist traps, and in fact, full of ar arrogant English tourists at that. Even worse, uh, the English colonized the Middle Rhine. If what was most prized was the harmonious interdependence of humans and their natural surroundings, as I want to argue, then I think what Germans felt was that the exemplary place to find this was not in the exceptional or the sublime. It was in the kind of the everyday landscape, the ordinary everyday landscape, places where generations of cultivation had left their traces in the land. Um, and this brings us to this key word, Kulturlandschaft, cultivated landscape. Um, which runs through the work of people who write on landscape in the 19th century. Um, uh, the idea of a cultivated landscape scape, as an organic blend of the natural, the cultivated, and indeed the built environment. Uh, uh, you find in a writer, uh, it's a conservationist, an important one, called Paul Schulze Naumburg uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, who later, in fact, became a member of parliament for the National Socialist Party. Um, Schulte Naumburg uh, called for uh, preserving the harmonious balance between hills, streams, meadows, orchards, cultivated fields, walls, roads, houses. Um, it's not wilderness. It's not the exceptional and the sublime. It's this cultivated landscape. And as William Rollins has shown in his book, A Greener 
uh, vision of home. This was also the dominant image in the stylized sketches and woodcuts, the visuals, that appeared in Heimark publications. And the same message is one that's pumped out in, in time of war. There's a book called The German Landscape, Past and Present, edited by a man called uh, Ernst Boscher, who was a founder of the Garden City movement in Germany. And Boscher calls upon Germans, this is in World War I, to defend, so it's not just the, the forests and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the streams, uh, the woodlands, but it's also the fields and meadows, the evidence of human, uh, of, of human activity in the land, the marks of settlement. So if the landscape became a marker of German identity in the 19th and 20th centuries, the ideal German landscape was pastoral, not wild. Its most familiar shorthand was the fruitful garden. And again, we take the Rhine as an example. There's a, another nice paradox that the very period when the idea of the Romantic Rhine was being constructed by tourists, well, by literary figures, uh, by uh, composers, by guidebook writers, um, a different part of the River Rhine, the Upper Rhine, um, I have a chapter about this in the book, was literally reconstructed by engineers. Um, what they did was to straighten all the kinks and take out all the oxbow bends, uh, creating out of this very wide meandering river um, filled with uh, islands and sandbars and sand channels, creating a river which was shorter, straighter, narrower, deeper, and faster, and also colder, except where it was used for cooling industrial plant, in which case it became hotter. So only, only in the modern age have we literally been able to make rivers run hot and cold, depending on what, what, what they've been used for. So the environmental bits keep breaking through into a talk which is actually dedicated to, to landscape. But what I wanted to say about the, uh, the Rhine, which was the upper Rhine that was produced uh, as a result of this, uh, literally this recasting of the river, is that it allowed cultivation to stretch right down to the river's edge. It displaced the old wetland forests and the, the marshy land. Uh, so out go the fishermen and the, and the fowlers, the bird hunters, and in come the people, the, the farmers growing crops and the, and the uh, or, or grazing animals. And many observers are entranced by this. Uh, the Palatine writer August Becker, he describes this Rhine plain as being so fruitful and luxuriantly green, so thoroughly planted and cultivated that it seems like one great garden. Uh, we find the same image uh, in the 20th century from Heinrich Wittmann. He said that this Rhine rectification had, quote, turned the Rhine plain into a blooming garden. I just want to give you a few more quotations to drive this idea home. We find similar language seen in other parts of Germany. When the Oderbruch is drained in the 18th century, uh, it's subsequently written about by localist 19th century writers again and again in the same terms. Uh, a blooming province, says one. A green land, says another. A large and beautiful garden, says a third. The garden was ubiquitous as an image. It was the ideal landscape of the, of the uh, landscape beautification movement of the earlier 19th century. Um, it's also a, a great motif in Heimat writers, uh, like the Saxon August Trinius, who urged fellow countrymen to become acquainted with, again his phrase, the great green garden of Germany. So you've got the idea, green gardens. Now, Trinius is writing in World War I. A reminder again uh, that uh, connections between landscape and national character have a political dimension. Nowhere was this more important than in the German East. And nowhere else did the great green garden of Germany have such dark undertones. Um, and this is something uh, uh, I talk about it uh, uh, in, in an entire chapter of the book, trying to, I'm going to try and abbreviate it uh, now. But I, what I try to show, what I want to argue, is that the, uh, the essential German take on the eastern lands is that before the Germans arrive, these lands are always they're either too wet or too dry. Right? They're too swampy or too sandy. It's a bit like you know, Goldilocks and the porridge. It's too hot or too cold. And the Germans will, it'll be just the right temperature. Neither too wet nor too, nor too dry. And so the language used by historians and by geographers when they write about these lands, but the, the language also used by leading Nazi officials, uh, by figures 
prominent figures like Himmler, who says that we, the Germans, will turn the Ukraine into, a, into, a, into California. It'll be filled with orchards. It'll become California uh, under German tutelage. Uh, the landscape planners constantly talk about turning the land green. Um, the refugees who are driven out of eastern Germany constantly talk about this great green garden they've left behind. Um, and it's actually very striking that uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the color coding, um, uh, you find it in literature, you find it in political documents. The Slavic color, the Polish color, Ukrainian color is always gray, the German color always green. And if you read these Nazi planning documents, you'll see that they have something called a Großgrün Plan a large-scale green plan. And they talk about the grün Gestaltung, the greening or the green shaping of Eastern Europe. And there are, in fact, ecological as well as racist and aesthetic values. It's that same melange uh, wrapped up in these plans. So I want to move uh, uh, towards a, a, a conclusion here. Um, you'll be aware that as, I, as I've moved through from the, the seashore, the mountains, to the forest, and then to the uh, to, the, um, to the garden. Uh, the adjective green has appeared a lot in this account of uh, landscape and German national identity. It's a different meaning of the word green uh, from the one we associate with that term today, for the most part, um, uh, whether in the USA or in Germany with its powerful environmental movement, its very successful green energy companies, and of course its Green Party, which has actually shared power at national level. Can you imagine a minister, of, minister for the environment who comes from the Green Party? Ralph Nader in charge of... Uh, uh, no, I can't imagine it, no. I mean, yesterday was great and all that, but, you know, we're not quite, uh, not quite there. Um, so, an obvious question. What's the connection, if any, uh, between the sentiments that I've been describing and present-day environmentalism? Um, it's certainly true that the curious melange of conservationist and aesthetic and folkish views that you've heard about um, enjoyed an afterlife in the post-war Federal Republic, certainly down to the 1960s. Uh, quite a few of those Heimat conservationists who were active in the Third Reich remained active into the 1960s. Some were signatories of a, a document called the Green Charter of Meinau in 1961, which is think, rightly regarded as a kind of link between older conservationists and modern Greens. Um, one of those signatories was Alvin Seifert, who worked as a landscaping advisor on the Nazi autobahn projects. He's the person who coined that dubious environmentalist term for Steppel, and who also wrote an autobiography late in his life with the very self-serving title, A Life for the Landscape. Wonderful poignancy to that title. Um, a few figures with views like uh, Seifert's found their ways into the Green Party when it emerged at the end of the 1970s. And there was even a term for them, the so-called avocado uh, syndrome. It's just people who are green on the outside, but they have a kind of brown kernel, a sort of Nazi inside. But just about everyone agrees, uh, just about, not, not quite everyone, but almost everyone agrees that the Green Movement of the last 30 years was fundamentally different from these earlier movements. That its politics, as it were, were green all the way through, not brown in the middle. Um, it was more ecologically based than earlier landscape conservationists. Its policies were not authoritarian and racist and sexist. They were, in fact, leaned very strongly towards the feminist, the pacifist, and the anti-authoritarian. And it defended the Green Party, the rights of minorities in Germany probably more vigorously than any other party, well, certainly more vigorously than any other party. The Greens embodied the approach, think globally, act locally, unlike the people that I've been talking about for the most part in today's lecture, whose slogan might have been, think nationally, act locally. All that's true, and it's important to say, because there have been those, uh, it's much rarer now than it was in the 1980s, say, who unjustly tried to tar the Greens with a brown brush to argue that this was another extremist party uh, of dubious uh, values. But beyond guilt by association, um, there are in fact more subtle examples of what, well, of how German environmentalism today has in fact drawn on the past. And in making these final remarks and bringing the American case back in, I think I want to remind you all of the ultimate ambiguity and malleability of all ideas 
There aren't some ideas that are associated with the left and some with the right in perpetuity. Ideas are malleable. They can, they can be transmuted. They can be put into new form. Uh, the concept of Heimat, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it once seemed irredeemably tainted by its misuse under National Socialism. But it's been reclaimed from the 80s as a kind of left of center, eco-friendly, localist cause, as a name for something completely different. Green writers have constructed genealogies of early environmental thinking, as they would see it, that includes conservatives whose ideas, that in other respects, they were completely ab abhor. And Wil Wilhelm Heinrich Riel comes back in here. He was claimed in the 1930s as a proto-Nazi. Then in the 1980s, he's claimed as a proto-Green. Both ideas are equally plausible, or perhaps implausible. There, is every, there, there are many things in Riel, um, enough to justify aftercomers claiming him from these radically different positions as their own. Now, some of the ideas I've talked about today, which were embedded in the 19th and the first half of the 20th centuries in conservative and even openly racist German views of the world, um, have enjoyed new life recently within a quite different worldview. One is the idea of the Dauerwald, or sustainable forest, a view put forward in the late 19th century, the 1920s, by these racist foresters. Now, no one uses the word today. Uh, the associations are simply too negative. Um, but the core idea of the sustainable mixed forest, um, minus the racist packaging, completely minus the racist packaging, is at the heart of what today's environmentally sensitive forestry service in Germany pursues as so-called uh, close to nature forestry, natur nah, is the adjective. And then finally, there's this term, the Kulturlandschaft, this cultivated landscape, this pastoral vision of the green German landscape, infused with these ideas of German superiority, even with ethnic racist ideas in the past. Um, and yet, there is, I want to end by arguing, another more positive side to this German idea of the cultivated landscape. If you believe that a historically well-founded and effective approach to the environment in the USA, say, means questioning the primacy of the idea of wilderness as the dominant idea, and I do believe that, then it makes a lot of sense to pay attention to the cultivated landscape, where humans work the land, change the land, uh, where they work with the land, not the land as something apart, nature, wilderness. Uh, and the real questions are how you work the land, on what terms, with what degree of responsibility. As the German environmental historian Tom Leakin has noted, that's one of the points where scholars working on Germany and American environmentalist historians, most obviously with these arguments, Bill Cronin and Richard White, where they can find common ground. Um, this may also be a pointer, this focus on cultivated landscape. It may also be a pointer to how the extraordinary successes of the green agenda in Germany, politically and in society as a whole, uh, might be one uh, in, the, in the US as well. But that, of course, would be another, another lecture. But it's an interesting thing to broach on this, on, this, on this happy day. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, thank you. That was slightly longer than I'd intended, but I do hope there will, there's certainly time for, 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 for as many questions as you have to throw at me. So please, please do. Yes. Um, I was interested in your discussion of the forest and the symbol of, of national identity. And I was thinking that in the 19th century US, the symbols of national identity, um, well, uh, the future national parks, tended to be places that were not suited for agriculture, were not considered suitable for agriculture. Yes. So I was wondering, could you speak to the question of what um, the economic, or what was the land property rules governing the forest in the 19th century? I mean, whose yeah. land was it? Whose right. forest was it? Right. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question and a fundamental one. And it also brings, it brings into focus the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the two axes of history are time and space. And I've been, t people often forget the spatial one because it's the one I've been mainly talking about. But the time axis um, uh, is so different if we're comparing, uh, comparing the history of the uh, 
uh, of what happens in the American West. Uh, well, with Western expansion, obviously, there's a, a longer history of Native American history of the West. But um, we're talking here about uh, a history which, which begins really only in the 19th century, whereas in Germany, we're talking about literally centuries. Uh, I mean, that is a fundamental difference, and it's why the wilderness, uh, uh, I mean, uh, why, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why the wilderness idea is so much weaker in Germany, that, is that simply there, are, there is such a long history of, of, of cultivation of the, of the land. Um, ownership, I mean, f f uh, there is a long history of disputes over ownership of the forest. They belong, the ownership is differently vested. Sometimes some of them are owned by the princes, some by the aristocrats, some by municipal councils. Uh, um, there are considerable struggles going back to the, at least to the 16th century. You can measure these by forest ordinances, which are attempts really to prevent, uh, by the owners of the forest, to prevent peasants from, uh, from what's called forced frivol. Uh, frivol is kind of what acts of... Well, no, it's, it's, a, it's cry, I mean, cry, uh, <laughs> property crime, it's a particular kind of forest property crime, and it might be damaging trees, pick, even to picking up, you know, things which have been left on the forest floor, uh, which are not, to which the peasantry are not legally entitled, but which they often grab for themselves, and, or grazing their animals where, like pigs, you know, for the acorns, where they're not, not supposed to graze them. Um, so uh, ownership is very widely spread, and ownership disputes are an important part of, of debates over forest usage. Um, and to finish off this long answer to your, to your question, um, what, it, it's interesting, this casts an interesting sidelight on, on a very contentious issue in recent years. The, there used to be a belief that there was a major wood shortage in Germany in the 18th century. And from this, many things flowed, the need for extracting coal as an alternative energy source. But it now turns out that the thrust of argument is, of revisionist argument, is that wood shortages were in many ways a kind of construct. They were deliberately created by, I mean, the, the arguments were made by, by the owners of the estates and the scientific foresters as an argument for pushing the peasants out. Um, so that, that's a big, that's a very big, uh, very big debate. So ownership is a, key, is, a, is a key issue, yeah. And they're definitely, you know, the resources of the forest are very important. I mean, timbers are rafted down the Rhine and used to create, uh, you know, they, they build, D Dutch ships are built with, uh, with timbers which are floated down the, down the Rhine, especially. The Rhine is full of these gigantic rafts which come from Schwarzwald and other areas. So thank you for the question. Yeah, David. I have a rather vague, maybe incoherent question, which I will preface with a perhaps irrelevant uh, remark, uh, which is that uh, uh, the German natural sciences have been very much involved in these questions. Yeah. It is the Germans who in the 18th century really sort of found forced Wissenschaft, the science of the Absolutely. Form. I mean, that far proceeds, for example, the Nazis or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and if you think of the tradition also that comes out of Alexander von Humboldt of measuring the Earth, of geophysics, that of uh, and Gauss and Weber, who are very much concerned with determining meridians, um, determining spaces, and what have you. Uh, of course, they're not alone in this. The British, for various imperial reasons, are, are also very much concerned. Uh, but my point is, first of all, that there, there's a, a serious exact science tradition in Germany that yes. is, I think, somehow related to the various points that you made, yeah. which brings me to my vague question. Right. <laughs> and I think you kind of touched on this in the beginning of your talk, uh, which of course was about landscapes, but you also mentioned boundaries. And it seems to me the Germans have a, a very big problem, unlike Americans, what Tim was talking about in the beginning, and certainly unlike the Brits, because, of course, the UK is an island, and it's well-defined. But there's always a problem about exactly what Germany is. I mean, where, where does it end? Does it end on the Rhine? Does it go into Strasbourg? Does it end on the Oder? Does it end in the Austrian-speaking world? And, and you can think, you can extend this in lots of different ways, and of course, it depends what, are we talking about the 18th century? Are we talking about today and what, what have you? So I guess this, this this question is, I mean, Germany is Mitteleuropa, yeah. and it doesn't have 
the well-defined natural boundaries that Britain and, mm. to a certain extent, the United States does. So it seems to me that, in this incoherent question, that there's, in some sense, a relationship for in the need for having exact measuring sciences yep. in Germany and the various identity issues and national political issues right. all the way over there on the other hand. Right. Thank you. No, I, I mean, the, no, that was I mean, entirely coherent. Can I, 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 it's a comment on forestry science. As, as, you're absolutely right. Uh, the thing which I find intriguing is that people writing from an uh, kind of environmental <coughs> historical perspective uh, seem to be unable to make up their minds whether the German tradition of uh, scientific management of forests was a good thing or a bad thing. If you, I was at a conference, in, a small conference at, uh, at Harvard, we had some, some outside visitors last Friday on the idea of sustainability. Um, and one of the papers by an, uh, an English uh, historian uh, uh, who's, um, well, it, it, was a, it was trying to trace the, there's a German word, uh, Nachhaltigkeit is the German word for sustainability. You can find the word Nachhaltend in German forestry manuals in the 17th century. And uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, several historians have done this. There's a, the German historian called Joachim, Joachim Radkau has also talked about German scientific forestry as a place where you have a long tradition going back centuries of the idea of sustainable, responsible management of a resource. So this is, as it were, German scientific forestry as a good thing. But then if you read a book which many people beyond, uh, across the historical profession, different subfields have read. James C. Scott's book, Seeing Like a State. A book, Scott is at Yale, he's a kind of sociologist, anthropologist, historian. I mean, he's a, a, he's a jack of all trades. He's, he's, a, wonderful, he's a wonderful writer. Um, he coined the phrase, weapons of the weak, in an earlier book. Um, and seeing like a state has become a kind of catchphrase in itself. His argument is that you know, in the modern age, there's a whole series of giganticist and, and all and uniformly damaging um, interventions by uh, abstract uh, centralizing states uh, in the lives of ordinary people, and they always do more harm than good. So right down to the kind of you know uh, Soviet schemes, which end up uh, you know destroying you know, the, the the Aral Sea and so on. And he starts his story in the 18th century with Prussian forestry. So he, here, so e either the Prussian foresters are a good thing because they're early examples of sustainable development, or they're a bad thing because they're, they're at the, you know, the, the fountain origin of, of, of all wicked modern public works schemes. So I, I just say that for what it's worth. Um, just, yes, east, east, west. It's, we were talking just before the lecture about Christopher Clarke's new book, Iron Kingdom, A History of Prussia. And one of the many things that I admired in that book, and I mean, you will remember from having read it recently too, one of the things he does is to, is quite unapologetically to talk about Prussia's geography. Um, and he does it very uh, persuasively, uh, and he makes the geography count. Even 20 or 25 years ago, this would have, well, for all I know, it might still get him into trouble with some people in Germany, but the idea that, that geopolitics, that the geographical position of Germany, uh, of Prussia, had some shaping effect, was considered really problematic by liberal historians in Germany because it seemed to be so much that kind of, it, it seemed to be along the lines of that geography is destiny kind of thinking, which was so tainted. I mean, tainted not just in national socialism, but tainted by you know, people like uh, Ellsworth Huntingdon in this country and you know, many, many other scholars uh, who drew, again, large and often racist assumptions on, on the basis of, you know, river valley civilizations are like this, and mountain peoples are like that, and, you know, uh, very often Asiatic culture came into this. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? I mean, geography does matter, and, uh, uh, and the geopolitical position of Prussia, Germany, does matter. And then finally, borders, yes, I mean, fixing, I think one of the things I certainly comes up in the early chapters of the... Uh, of the conquest of nature is how the uh, Prussian swamp draining under, under Frederick the Great is very much connected with trying to fix the boundaries of an expanding, rather amorphous state. Because exactly these kind of amphibious areas, which uh, were, you know, yeah, 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 no. for the railroads, Moltke, for example, is a big supporter of geography and physical geography and measuring 
So yeah. that we're yeah. with the railroads, and that's essential for the military. Uh, right, and from right, and from the eight, right, 18th century through the 19th, and it, it, for the for the chaussee and for the highways of the 18th century, and then the railroads uh, for for the uh, to. St uh, army needs are always central. I mean, even in the 18th century for Frederick, uh, draining marshes is a way of, uh, it, 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 it prevents these places. I mean, uh, marshes and swamps are associated with, with wild animals, but they're also associated with kind of bandits and ne'er-do-wells and deserting soldiers. So you want to clean up all these places that soldiers can desert to. Uh, so, right, I mean, this, sunlight is the best disinfectant of, of all of these undesirable elements, whether they're army deserters, bandits, or wolves. Uh, so thank you. Uh, yes, I think I saw you first. Thoughts on Germans' attraction to our national parks compared to other Europeans. Is it just that more Germans are touring, or is there a direct connection to their desire to come to these parks? I, I think the... Um, the, the, the German interest in uh, national parks, uh, I, w I was thinking not so much of today. I, I, I don't, my, my sense is that there is less interest today than there was, but there was interest in an early stage of, uh, of, of American national parks as a kind of model, uh, as a model, a except that it pretty rapidly became apparent that, that the scale was such that you couldn't simply take over the take over the idea. I mean, I, um, this is from the late 19th century onwards, there's a huge traffic, a transnational traffic in all kinds of ideas, whether it's about national park, you know, the garden city movement, you know, backwards and forwards between Britain and, Britain and Germany. So I think this is just one example of, of, of a particular moment where there is German interest uh, uh, in, in, in a particular American model. Uh, but it, uh, there is the, the only very large scale national parks in Germany are actually things which are established during, right, during, during Nazi dominance in Eastern Europe, where they suddenly have very large tracts of land. Uh, so you can suddenly, um, you, you can suddenly practice conservation uh, uh, with other people's land, like Polish land. So that, that's really, I was thinking more historically than, 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 than present day. And look back. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, it's almost like the wilderness, you know, that we all believe it still exists, but it's yes. diminishing. You know, I don't, I, I mean, when I just think of, of the things, that's the, the voluminous things I've read over the years, uh, I, I mean, I can certainly remember lots of plaintive references among uh, 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 among those who deplore you know, p pollution and the and the rectification of so-called of, of rivers and the uh, 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 and of the uh, the use of mountains uh, the canalization of mountain streams to float logs down and so on. That you you frequently get these uh, uh, sort of s almost standard generic complaints that the once you know uh, icy pure you know hillside stream has now been polluted and so on. Um, but I don't see any. I don't see any particular German, and, it, and it's, it's interesting, I mean, uh, beyond the fact that uh, there are associations of water with, you know, with purity and rebirth and you know, heavy Christian underlay to all of those things, I, I, I really don't associate anything specifically German with those, uh, with, with, with that. Um, no, I don't. I mean, as an issue in social and political debate, it's, it's, it's powerful. As it, but the debates are not so different in Germany from what they are in other countries which are industrializing. Um, uh, I mean, it, uh, this, um, first of all, the fishermen complain that the fish are dying, uh, and then the, the farmers complain. Uh, this is before the farmers themselves become the, the chief polluters uh, in the 20th century. Um, 
Um, and then you know, um, kind of there's, there's a particular scandal, and so there's an inquiry, and then there's legislation. And it's, this is happening in the second half of the 19th century. It's pretty much, I mean, it, it's not so different from what you'd find in, uh, in Britain or the, or the US, US, nor is the time scale. And it finds its uh, expression in, in, in works of fiction. There's a famous one called Pfister's Mill, which is about a, a, a case of a, of, a, of a stream being poisoned by a, a sugar refinery. So, there's, I mean, there is an enormous amount of uh, debate about this. Um, uh, but, I mean, the, the, what I think you were suggesting, the sort of a, a particularly powerful kind of German identification with, with pure water, I don't find anything specifically in the... I mean, nothing like as powerful as this, what I see as a dominant idea of kind of the green garden, Germany as orchard, you know, that kind of idea. But thank you, it's a very interesting question. I think Professor Mahoney and then a question there. Two very precise and practical questions related to forests, one having to do with access, both historically and today. Um, can one just pull off the road if you see a, an interesting looking forest and walk through it openly? In the United States, that's often a risky proposition. Uh, obviously, if it's a park, it's fine. But it's a park like that thing. I ask this because in Eastern Germany, particularly in Poland, uh, there are national laws that allow, if anything is designated as a forest and private land, any citizen has the right to pull off and walk through it and enjoy the forest, which seems to be uh, extraordinary. And that's quite different from the American practice. And, and, and the second thing is that you, you've marked several times about how deciduous forests or mixed forests, forests tend toward all pines, very tall pines with the, with the canopy of, of pines high up. And it creates a particular kind of dense forest, which uh, anybody who's not walked through such a forest, but I think some of us know that forest, is really impenetrable in many ways, very, very, very mysterious. What is their problem with that? I mean, as, as the climate goes north, it, it turns toward m m Minnesota like forest. You see what I'm saying? Pine and, and white birch, as opposed to more mixed and, and, and like you get down here in Nebraska, uh, etc. Those are two practical ones. Yeah. Uh, the other one is you mentioned that word for steppel. Uh, it yeah. has a, a nice German word, has a uh, 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 a, a negative connotation. Yes. Drying out, flat, nothing of great value. It sounds in some ways oddly similar to the disparagement of the plains as the great <coughs> American desert. See what I'm going on? Yes. Has any movement evolved, although there aren't many plains in Germany, but certainly to the east there are flatlands. Has any movement occurred where there's a cultural attempt to uh, develop appreciation of flatlands and plains? Right. Great, great question. Let me start with that, that question. Um, well, because as we, as we know, we have, we have yeah. open plains. Yeah. You can go out to a plains yeah. at 10 minutes south of Lincoln near Denton and walk the prairie, a preserved yeah. prairie, etc. It's, 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 right. I, I think um, the, the, the reason why uh, Versteppung is so loaded is because the root word is step, and because the step is associated with Russia and, 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 and points east. And so the implication is that, uh, that German land will be turned into the kind of thing that only un uncultivated Russians would have. It's the association of, of desiccation, dust bowl, with, uh, with something which is kind of Russian or Asiatic, quote unquote, um, and which, which points to the fact that the, it's essentially, uh, it's, it's the step as something that belongs to the others. It's not your plains land, it's somebody else's plains. So it's, it's, a, it's a negative idea. But I mean, that's a simple answer, is it's the Germans looking at, uh, it's a German term which is really presenting other people's step land as being the problem. But that doesn't quite uh, resolve the problem, and this is where I can work back to your pine forest, of the fact that you know, within well, wherever we take the eastern boundaries of Germany to be, they're obviously a lot farther west now, but um, uh, that many parts of East Albion, Prussia, were themselves actually very sandy, and, and people even make jokes about that. Uh, Frederick the Great makes jokes about it. Uh, um, uh, Ang 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 the sandbox. The sandbox, yeah. Ang Engels, uh, uh, Engels talks about Prussia having... having uh, uh, being exceeded only by the Sahara, this is Friedrich Engels, as in Marx and Engels, uh, uh, East, East Elvian Prussia being exceeded only by the Sahara and the amount of sand it has. I mean, people make jokes about sandy Prussia. Uh, so it's actually, it's, it's, it's not just somebody else's problem. Um, is there a sense of local sort of pride? Uh, I mean, I would argue that there is a, 
there's a kind of love-hate relationship. I'm ma making this up as I go along because not enough people have actually written about what you might call East Albion sectional identity. Um, people always talk about the East Albion Junkers uh, without actually trying to reconstruct, I think, how, how those people and, and non-Junkers who lived there actually felt about their own landscape. Um, I think there is... Uh, see, what's interesting is that all those people who celebrate the Eastern lands, they're always looking for the green bits to celebrate. Uh, <coughs> it is very remarkable. Um, <laughs> it's as if they can't find a way of living, li living happily with, with, the f with the flatlands and, 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 and any hint of sand. That's, I mean, that's just, um, I think that's as far as I probably want, want, want to go of, 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 of musing on whether the idea of the step land is uh, in some ways projected onto others because it's a bit too close to home. But I, that certainly isn't anything, I mean, there, there isn't anywhere in, in Germany now which could be described as, as Great Plains. I mean, it's all in countries farther east. I mean, it's in you know, Poland and Belarus and so on. Um, pines. Uh, the, the, the argument is really that, uh, that, these, that this is kind of, um, that they plant pines because they're quick to grow and quick to harvest. So it's kind of, that it's commercially driven, uh, um, this planting. Um, uh, and that where this is done in areas which would sustain mixed forestry, that it's a kind of, that, that it's a misuse of the soil, um, that, it, that it weakens the soil, uh, that it lowers the water table. I mean, th things that we would, you know, I mean, it, that's the argument really, that it's, that it's a commercial decision uh, to, to get this kind of return from forests through planting kind of quick, quick cheap, you know, pines. Access. Um, I'm trying to think of when I've, uh, have I ever chanced it in, uh, in Germany. Um, Oh, there are private there are private forests and you would be told I mean there are there are there are there are private forests some of them are even some of them are even owned by the Chinese government uh, uh, this was one of the things I was asked questions about during that interview um, what did I think about the Chinese buying up the German forest and I said that I thought it was pro pro probably better than you know other things you know, better than them buying up the German aerospace industry but uh, um, I mean it, 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 it's, they're not buying up very much of it so the Chinese have a lot of money to spend on all kinds of things but no I mean there, there, are, there are private forests and there are public forests and you'd get the same problems if you tried to trespass on, on that on that on those private tracts of forest land as you would in in this country uh, yes I think there was um, yes you, you didn't get your question and then I, I mustn't neglect this side as well but uh, actually I should, probably should take one from this side next uh, uh, please do um, I'm speaking from Austria because that's where I spent most of my time mm -hmm. but there is absolutely true if the forest is private it has to be fairly marked and it should be somehow gated off otherwise you yes. don't want to anywhere and it would be marked uh, privat or in privat besitz or something other other so the default position is different. Unless it says, so what is not forbidden is, is permitted, as opposed to what is... Not, right. Good, good. It's good to know. So, sir. I'm interested in interesting parallels between um, America and Germany and rooting national identity in the landscape. You mentioned Frederick Jackson Turner. Uh, despite the rather strenuous efforts of people who keep Western history, three among them, um, the idea is uh, the frontier thesis that, that, that Turner um, issued in, in 1893 really still affects and suffuses American public yeah. culture, music, writing, politics. Uh, it's very hard even for uh, a left-leaning candidate to escape that mythology altogether. I'm wondering if you mentioned maybe an equivalent of the Kuralancha, if there's any way or to a similar extent that suffuses the German imagination even down to the present. Yeah, yeah, yes, but I, I, it does, but I don't think the... Par I mean, I think they're different cases. Well, they're different, they're not... Right, I mean, I'm sure you're right about... Uh, uh, 
that despite the best efforts, I mean, including the best efforts of historians like uh, uh, Patty Limerick to, 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 and, and yourself and you know, countless historians uh, to, to deconstruct uh, mythic versions of the frontier. Um, and in fact, to show that the, the reality of the frontier is really utterly different from the one which is projected in the myth. Nonetheless, the, the frontier thesis kind of unvarnished is still there. Um, I mean, I, it seems to me that one shouldn't, I mean, I mean, you may disagree, but we probably wouldn't disagree, but that um, in rejecting the myth, we shouldn't, as it were, throw out the value of the frontier thesis as, as something which is now there itself, part of the historical record. Um, and that's my interest in it. And there is a lot, again, a lot of intellectual traffic back and forth between Germany and the US. I mean, such prominent figures as Max Weber. When, when Weber came to the St. Louis Expo in 1904, um, he gave a talk about Europe and America and, 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 and land and the effects of, 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 uh, of, of the kind of the open, more or less the open frontier on politics and the differences between Europe and the USA. Uh, Max Sering, um, who I've drawn on in the book, is another social, German social scientist of this period who um, uh, travels around uh, the US and Canada and writes about American settlement. I mean, he's very influenced. These people are sharing ideas about the frontier. And the interesting thing is that these have, uh, have continued on in this popular mythology uh, in this country um, through the Western and other genres, and not to the same degree in Germany. I mean, the Wild East, the German Wild East ended with, you know, with, with the, the, the horrors and the catastrophe of 1944-45 of, of both German crimes and of this dreadful kind of rolling back, the, uh, you know, the 10, 12 million Germans who fled, fled west. That was it. That's the end. There is uh, only historians like me talk about um, the German Wild East, and it's, and it's something that's purely historical. It goes up to 1944. Well, for a few refugees, it's still, it's still alive, but they're, you know, they're, they're dying off, and their children and grandchildren and now great-grandchildren are not interested. So Kulturlandschaft is different, though, because it's, it, it's not such a loaded... Well, it had this loaded past, but it just means cultivated landscape. And I do believe in the capacity of words to be stripped of these unpleasant, dark, racist meanings and to be put back to work. And I think this is, this is such a word. Well, why don't we uh, thank Professor Blackburn for uh, an excellent talk.